Hello and welcome to this video where I'm going to explain and solve the hardest A-level maths question from the 2022 exam series. I'll be using the LXL exam board just because this is the most widely used exam in the country. So the way I figured out what the hardest question from this exam was is I looked at the grade boundaries for each individual paper. Now the paper with the lowest grade boundaries, i.e. the lowest mark required to get a specific grade, is usually the paper with the hardest questions. And this is because you can get less raw marks but still get the same grade because the questions are harder so less people get the marks themselves. And from the 2022 exam series for LXL, the paper with the lowest grade boundaries, i.e. the hardest paper, was paper one. So what I've done is I've gone to paper one and I've gone to the final question as the final question is usually the hardest. Hopefully that makes sense my reasoning behind why I've done this paper and this question and now I'll get into the video, enjoy. Figure six shows a sketch of the curve C with the parametric equations x equals eight sine squared t and y equals two sine two t plus three sine t, where t is a value bounded between zero and pi over two. Uh, the region R, shown in the shaded area in figure 6, is bounded by C, the x-axis, and the line with the equation x equals 4. Now the first part of the question asks, show that the area of R is given by the integral between limits of A and 0 of this expression here, with respect to T, where A is some sort of constant to be found. Okay, so this is basically asking us a parametric integration question. So, what is that really saying? Well, I'm sure lots of you would have memorized this formula, but a normal integral when we look at it is some integral between uh, two limits, we'll call them b and c, just because we already have a in the question, of some function of x, uh, we'll call it f of x, with respect to x. Or usually you'll see something similar of, again, an integral between these limits of y with respect to x. Okay, now a parametric integration is a little bit different because what we've got now is you've got these functions um, for x and y, which are functions of t. So I can write that as sort of x as a function of t is equal to 8 sine squared t, as given in the question, and y is also a function of t, which is equal to 2 sine 2t two plus 3 sine Okay, so we have to sort of slightly adapt this integration we're used to to get sort of an equivalence um, for when we're using parametric integration. And there's kind of three things we need to change. First, we need to change the limits. Second we need to thing we need to change is this y. And the third thing we need to change is what we're kind of integrating with respect to. It's no longer with respect to x, it'll be with respect to t. Okay, so let's start by looking at the limits. So the limit of our original function are 4 and 0. So I can write b is equal to 4, c is equal to 0. And you can see that on the diagram, right? The, the limits are x equals 4 and x equals 0. So now what we need to do is find some equivalents um, for t values. And all we do there is plug these values for x into our equation for x in, in terms of t. So for example, we have the equation that um, 4 is equal to 8 sine squared t. I call this uh, t1 just to see what we're solving for. Okay, um, we can rearrange this to say that x is the same as a half equals sine squared t. So the sine t equal, well, x root a half plus minus. So sine t is equal to plus minus root a half, which is the same as um, root two over two, because that's one over root two, and then if we rationalize, we get root two over two. And then um, you might notice just from um, basic, just memorizing it, but uh, you can always consult your calculator. These are always calculators. Um, important thing to note is it's important to have your calculator in radians for this, or if you have it in degrees to convert to radians. So mine's in degrees at the moment, so I'm gonna get an angle, which I'm pretty sure is uh, gonna be 45 degrees. Yep, and um, we can check the negative as well. Negative 45, okay. So we get that T1, is equal to either, we have two options, 45 degrees or negative 45 degrees. To put that into radians, that's pi over 4 or negative pi over 4. Now, a lot of students get, get kind of a, a bit caught up here. Um, essentially, what this is, is because we're squaring it, there's two values that, when squared, give the same value. But remember that t exists between 0 and pi over 2. So it's going to have to be this. So in the exam, write a little, a little comment saying, t exists between 0 and pi over 2, therefore t cannot equal negative pi over 4, so t1 must equal pi over 4. 
So that's our first limit. To get the second limit, we do the exact same thing, but now we're substituting zero. So zero is equal to eight sine squared t. Quite simply, that means that zero is equal to sine t. Right, because sine squared, if sine squared t is zero, then sine t is also zero, plus minus zero, but it's the exact same thing. And therefore we can know that, I'll call it t2 by the way, t2 is now equal to zero, because sine zero is zero. Also sine pi is zero, sine two pi, etc. But remember, t exists between zero and pi over two, so it must be a t2 zero. So now we've got our limits. Instead of b and c, what we've got as our limits is pi over four and zero. Okay, so that's the first thing we've adapted, the limits. The second thing we need to now adapt is this value of y. And all we're going to do is put in the equivalent. Okay, so remember initially we were talking about when we what you when you first learn when you learn integrals is something like this, which I'll actually put in the actual value. So four zero y dx. But we're saying that's the equivalent of um, something else. So that four, when we're doing it with respect to t, goes to pi over four, and I've just shown y. And the zero stays at zero. Now instead of y, what we put in is our is our function for y in terms of t, which is two sine two t plus three sine t. But now we can no longer be integrating with respect to x, so it's the function of t's. So instead we need to integrate with respect to t. But dx and dt just aren't the same thing. Okay? How you figure out the relationship between dx and dt is you can do a clever thing where you find dx by dt, i.e. the integral of x with respect to t, uh, sorry, the derivative of x with respect to t. So now we're using a bit of, um, remember that x is equal to 8 sine squared t. It's now a bit of train rule. Okay, so the 2 comes off, so we have 60 sine t, and then what does sine differentiate to? Differentiates to cos. So if dx by dt is equal to 16 sine t cos t, we can say that dx is equal to 16 sine t cos t dt. And therefore we've got some sort of equivalence between dx and dt. So we can substitute this whole thing in for dx. We've already got the dt here, but we've got now 16 sine t cos t. Okay. And now what we've done, and this is kind of explaining the, the itty bitties of uh, parametric integration, we've gone from what we know the area is equal to under the graph, and we've just converted this. Instead of now being integrating y with respect to x, we're integrating some function of t with respect to t with different limits. But it's all equivalent. And hopefully, the way I've shown it, you can see that everything is equivalent here. Okay, so what can we do now? Well, we know this is the case, but we're trying to get in this form of 8 minus 8 cos 40 plus 48 sine squared t cos t. So we can kind of use the answer to help us here. Essentially, we can see in the answer there's no sine 2t. Okay, so we kind of have to get rid of that. And you can consult your formula booklet or if maybe you remember it, which is great. But sine 2t is equal to 2 cos t sine t. Okay, so this whole thing. Now, in your exam, you lay it out much nicer than I've done here, is equal to the integral between pi over 4 and 0. So if sine 2t is 2 cos t uh, sine t, that whole thing goes to 4 sine t cos t plus 3 sine t, 16 sine t cos t dt. Okay. Now it looks much like, much like the actual answer, but we can expand out and, and, and see that. Okay, so we're just expanding brackets here. So again, integral between pi over four and zero. Now the four times the 16, that gives you 64 sine t cos t plus 48, sorry, sine squared t cos squared t. My apologies, because sine times sine is sine squared cos times cos is cos squared plus 48 sine squared t cos t dt okay now we're very nearly there but you see in our answer we have something 8 cos 4t okay so we kind of have to we've got this bit of our answer but we have to do something to this bit to kind of get closer to the answer so let's do that now so we've got the 48 sine squared t cos t but now we kind of have to rearrange this 64 sine squared t cos t we've got at the moment to 
get what the answer is looking for, which is 8 minus 8 cos 14. Okay, so how can we do that? Well, what does cos 40 equal? Cos 40, and you can get this from your formula booklet, is equal to cos squared 2t minus sine squared 2t. Okay, so we have that. Now that is the exact same as 1 minus 2 sine squared 2t. And that is from using the fact that cos squared t plus sine squared t is equal to 1. Or, you know, this could be t or 2t or 3t or whatever you want to put in there for t that holds. And a lot of people don't actually know why that holds. So let me show you that now. Now you can skip forward if you, if you know this already. But essentially, if you have a right angle triangle with angle t and this length from 1, this is a hypotenuse, right? Now this is the adjacent, this is the opposite. Remember from GCSE, sine t or sine theta is equal to opposite over hypotenuse. And cos t or cos theta maybe is equal to the adjacent over the hypotenuse. Okay. So therefore, if the hypotenuse is 1, quite simply, the adjacent is equal to cos t because we're dividing it by 1. So therefore, this is just cos t, and by the same logic, this is just sine t. Right, does that make sense? You're just using these formulas with the hypotenuse equal to 1. Cool, and therefore, Pythagoras theory, Pythagoras theorem, states a squared plus b squared equals c squared. Therefore, sine squared t plus cos squared t is equal to 1, because c here is 1. And that's where that comes from. It's very, very simple indeed. But a lot of students use that formula without knowing where it comes from. So I thought I'd just show you that. Okay. So we have this. And now what we can do is use our formula for sine 2t. Which we've already used before. That's 2 sine t cos t. And this whole thing's still squared. So it's sine squared 2t. Okay. Which yields an answer for this whole thing of 1 minus 8 sine squared t, cos squared t. That's what cos 4t is equal to. And remember that we've got 64 sine squared t, cos squared t. So we can rearrange this whole thing that we've just found to give us that 8 sine squared t, cos squared t is equal to 1 minus cos 40. And remember we've got 64, so we can just times everything by 8. So therefore the 64 sine squared t cos squared t we have in our expression at the moment is just equal to 8 minus 8 cos 40. Okay, so now all we've got is an equivalence for this, which is this. And therefore we can get our answer as it wants to show it, as the, as the question asks us to show it. So the integral for this area, this area is equal to the integral between pi over 4 and 0, because we solve the equivalence of the limits, of this expression 8 minus 8 cos 40 plus 48 sine squared t cos t with respect to t. And there we go, we found it. And that's probably enough to get all the marks, but you might just want to say, um, you know, therefore a is equal to pi over 3. And hopefully now that makes perfect sense and you can explain that to someone else. And that's how we've solved this first part of the question. So now let's move on to part B, which says, hence using algebraic integration, find the exact area of R. So when it says find the exact area of R, we know we don't want to be having any like messy decimals in there, etc., etc. We want everything to be a fraction or an expression. You know, pi's in there is fine. Just something that is perfectly exact. We don't want to be doing any simplification ourselves. Okay. So remember from part A and well, from the question. So even if you can get part A, you still be able to do part B, which is nice. We have this expression for what the area under the graph in the figure above shows us. Okay. And we need to integrate this. So, simply enough, this seems really easy to integrate. Well, this seems easiest to integrate, it's just a constant. This bit seems a bit tricky. Okay. 
but I'm going to show you a way that this is a bit tricky. If you have a good understanding of actually differentiation, you might even be able to see it straight away. Okay. So let's do the first parts, which are easier. So when we integrate, we put these square brackets. Now eight integrated, remember this is all with respect to t, it's just eight t. Cos, negative eight to cos 40 integrated. Well, if sine differentiates the cos, therefore cos integrates the sine. So we're gonna have this sine 40 as our base. Okay, and it's gonna be negative two. And the reason I knew it was negative two is because the way I like to think about it is to differentiate. So sine 40 differentiated would be four cos 40. But we need to get negative eight. So to get that negative eight, we times by negative two, which is why I put it in front. And then we've got this tricky expression here. Now, something to note is cos t is a derivative of sine t. Okay, so if you think back to chain rule, if I said differentiate sine cubed t, to differentiate that, it would be chain rule, so 3 sine squared t cos t. Now, 3 sine squared cos t is very similar to 48 sine squared cos t. Right. In fact, all you need to have is 16 of those to get the 48. Does that make sense? Maybe I'll, I'll show this properly. I'll do a little aside to show this. So because sin, cos t is the derivative of sine t, we can use the first chain rule. I.e. if I said differentiate, so d by dt of sine cube t, that is equal to 3 sine squared t. So now we've kind of, you know, chain rule. We've used sine t as a function, so we differentiate with respect to that, times sine t differentiated, which is cos t. And that is very similar to what we have. All we need to do is times it by 16 to get, to get the 48 that we're looking for. So we now find our integral in, in basically one step. I'm just using reverse chain rule and a kind of reverse chain rule again, really. Okay. Now, of course, you could go about this with some, some substitution, and then maybe some integration by parts, etc., etc. But if you have a really fundamental and good understanding of integration and in turn differentiation, um, then you can really do some one step, but it's really quick. So now what we're doing is is plugging our values. Okay. So eight, you know, eight pi over four. I will show this all nice. In your exam, it's it's really nice if you show every step. You know, you've got loads of paper. There's there's no reason not to really. Pi over four plus sixteen sine cubed. Subtract eight. Now we know this term's going to go to zero, but still, just for the sake of really showing the examiner I know what's going on, I am going to substitute the zero to every term. Okay. So eight times pi over four is equal to two pi. Sine of four pi over four is just sine pi, and if you think of, if you think of your sine graph, sine pi is zero, so that's going to be zero. Sine cubed pi over four. Now pi over, sine pi over four is root two over two. So we're going to cube root two over two, which would give us two root two over eight, just in my head, times by 16, it's going to be two root two. Okay. Uh, no, it would be four root two. And like I said, these terms are all going to go to zero, because sine zero is zero, and anything times zero is zero, so. Which means our final answer is just two pi plus four root two. And this is exact because we haven't simplified this, this root two, we haven't simplified pi. Everything's given as expression. This is the exact answer for the answer to this question of what this integral really equals. And there it is. That's me explaining and solving the hardest question from the 2022 A-level exam series. Hopefully you found this interesting, useful and informative. And if you want me to solve other questions for maybe different papers or different exams, please let me know down in the comments. Also, if you're interested in me tutoring you for A-level maths, which would involve doing some similar stuff to what I've done today, where I fully explain questions and we go through them together, there's a form in my description if you want to take a look at that. As always, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you soon.